well since you are standing up. Since you are standing up. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for tonight. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for what we are about to receive. It's, it is not about the man who delivered it, but it is about you. And I pray that every one of us will be equipped, refreshed, empowered by your word. And as, as we open our heart and our ears and our mind, I pray that the Holy Spirit works, change us, transform us into your image. And we vow to give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen. Hey, give a round of applause to all these guys. Thank you so much. You may be seated. That's the culture that we have in Jakarta. It's not the culture of the nation, but it will be. It will be. Because we started it. A culture of honor. Amen? But are you ready? Do you have your note ready? <laughs> Every now and then, I would reread the book of Genesis, especially the first three chapters. Especially the first three chapters. And everything, every time I revisit, I always get something new. It gives me insight into God's original purpose before sin entered the world and what happened right after that. It also gave me insight into who he is before men fell into sin. It's very important for all of us to know. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that God introduced himself as Elohim. God introduced himself as Elohim. It means the mighty God who creates, the creator God. Genesis 1 verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, many of you probably are aware that in the Bible, God revealed himself to humankind through many names especially in the Old Testament. For instance, he is Jehovah Rapha. I think you know what it means. The Lord is our healer. Or he is Jehovah Shalom. He is the Lord of our peace. Or Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And many other names. But you know that all these names that God has revealed to mankind is revealed in response to humans' fallen and human sinful condition. The name Jehovah and all other names that attach with it mention because God needs to move from creative mode into redemptive mode. But before men fell into sin, men never knew any lack. Men never knew any sickness. Men never knew any worry. Isn't that right? Yeah. Only after the fall that man knows sickness. Only after the fall that man knows what it means to lack of something. Only after the fall that man knows what worries. And because of his love to humankind, because of his love to all of us, then he introduced and revealed himself as a God who heals in response to our sickness. 
as a God who gives us peace in response to our worry, as a God who will provide in response to our lack. So when you lack of anything, if we lack of anything, we can come to Him for provision. When we worry, we can come to Him for peace. When we are sick, we can come for Him to Him for healing. But before Adam fell into sin, all Adam knew was God, the Creator. All he knew is God, the Creator. And that's why I believe that we are most like God when we are creative. That's why we must display God's creativity, especially in the church. Because for so long, churches all over the world forget about this truth. And what makes it worse is we are busy copying what the world does. Oftentimes, we don't realize the creative power that we have. Because we thought that creativity only belongs to an artist. And we are not an artist. But let me say this to you. When you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Spirit of the Creator God. That makes you a creative person. For so long, we limit the experience only to speaking in tongues. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's not important, but I just want you to realize the creative power that's available for you and I when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Creativity is God's nature. Yeah. God is a creat creator genius. And the greatness of God must express in His creativity. He's able to create universe, the sky, the earth, and everything in it. And all He needs to do is speak the word out. And everything that He spoke become reality. That's why I found out that in the beginning, words were not used just for communication. In the beginning, words were used to create. It was used to create first before it was used for communication. I found out that God was an organized God. He loves order. Look at the way He created things from day one to day six. He is a God of purpose. He had purpose for mankind before he even created them. I also found out that our goal in life is not to be successful, but our goal in life is to be fruitful. Because when he created Adam, he said to Adam, be fruitful and multiply. Why I like to revisit Genesis because it also gives me insight of who, into who we are, of what we are capable of, because we are created in His image and in His likeness. Yeah. That's why we need to be careful with our words, because our words create our world. Our words create our world. You need to be careful because you are like God. Your words are important. Having said that, let us turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 7 to 9. And I'm reading, I will read from New King James Version. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. 
The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are talking about the garden that God himself had created. This is even better than Disneyland. Because he is a creator genius. Imagine God in all his beauty, in all his splendor, in all his majesty. Created a garden. This is my question to all of you. What do you think the Garden of Eden looked like? What do you think? Just okay? Remember, it is not man who created that, but God himself who created the Garden of Eden. To me, the Garden of Eden must have been so, so beautiful, way better than what man could have ever done. Right? Anyone agree with me? Yeah. yeah, because it's not made by man, it's made by God himself. That's why I said it's better than Disneyland. But then something interesting happened. Because in the first 15, Genesis chapter 2, it says, Then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. I don't have any problem with keeping it. But to tend, I have a problem with that. In other translation, it says to cultivate it, to develop it. In other words, to make it better. Now imagine this, that God put Adam in the garden that he himself had made. And he commanded Adam to tend it to develop it, to cultivate it, to make it better. Wait a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, if I, was, if I were the one who made the garden, Adam would probably have done it easily because I'm not a gardener. But this is God himself who made the garden. And for your information, there is no record that Adam have, have, have never seen any other garden before. This is the only one. And he has never worked a day in his life. And he was not a gardener. Don't you think that what God asks of him is a little too much? Don't you think that what God asks of Adam is a little too much? To keep is to, to maintain as it is. And that would probably okay for Adam because he doesn't have to do anything much but to cultivate it. That's how I thought when, when God told me to start a church, our church, in 1998. When the Holy Spirit spoke to, into my heart for the very first time to start a church, I was like, really? Do you know what's happening in our country at this moment? In our cities? If you remember back, those, back in those days, there was so much political turmoil. That year when our second president stepped down and there were riots everywhere, looting, raping, buildings being burned down, churches being attacked, 
and burned down. Politics and economics were very unstable. And you want me to build a church? I thought you loved me. <laughs> I thought you loved me. Have you watched TV lately? Do you have internet connection in the heavens? Do you know what's going on? Do you read any news? Who am I? I didn't have any theological background. I was a banker. I didn't have any financial support whatsoever. And I just got married. <laughs> For your information. Don't you think what you are asking of me is a little too much? Or maybe you are in the same situation right now. I don't know who I'm talking to, but it's no coincidence that you are here right now listening to me. But this I also know about God. That He will not tell Adam to do something if Adam could not do it. He will not ask me to do something if he knew that I couldn't do it. He will not ask you to do something if he knows that you couldn't do it. Here is the lesson. When God gives instructions, he speaks to the potential inside of you. When God gives instructions, he speaks to the potential inside of you. When God tells someone to do something, it directly reveals the potential of that person. When God tells someone to do something, it directly reveals the potential of that person. And the Bible said he breathed into, Ad, into Adam his own spirit. And this is what I love about God. When he calls, he equips. When he gives you vision, there is always provision available. And I, and I love what, what I hear about, what I heard about Watoto from Pastor Gary Skinner when we, when we were having lunch today. That money is not the problem. Finance is never the problem. Because when you have vision, there's always provision available. God trusted the potential in Adam. He already equipped Adam to do the job. He knew what Adam could do before Adam knew that he could. He knew all along that I could build a church before I know that I can do it. He knows that you can do whatever he asks you to do. Now, we tend to have this concept. And I find it to be true all over. Whenever I go, we tend to have this concept that everything that comes from God is so perfect that we no longer can improve on it. We tend to have this concept that everything that comes from God is so perfect that we cannot do anything about that. But this is the truth. Whatever it is that God puts in your hands, you can always make it better if you work it. If you can, you, you, will, you can always make it better if you work it. It doesn't matter how beautiful the Garden of Eden was when God said to Adam, cultivate it, to tend it. There was always room for improvement. Always room for improvement. To work, to tend, to work means to invest. So whether it's in your marriage, it's in your ministry, in your job, your business, your study, Whatever it is that is in your hand with the Holy Spirit within you, you can work it. If you work it, sorry, you can always make it better. Yeah. When you work it, you can always make it better. 
back home, almost every year, we produce our, our own praise and worship album. And almost every time we finish recording, there's the media guy came up to me and tried to interview me. And they asked, what do you think about the recording? And this is my answer. It is the best. It is the best. It is even better than last year. But you know what? The next year when we did it again, after the recording session was finished, the media guy came up to me again and interviewed me and asked, what, what do I think about the recording? And my answer was, it is the best ever. <laughs> did I lie? Did I lie? No. But think about this. When you given time to do it again, when you, when you get a chance to work on it again, invest your time, your energy, you can always make it better. Always make it better. And that's how God's wire us. And I think all the preachers here can say amen to what I will say. That, you know, if we given a time on one Sunday to preach three times, the same message, after the first message was finished, if we are given a time to reconsider everything that we have said in the first service, I can guarantee you they will come up with a better one in the second service. Right? It's all the preacher here. Because we then said, oh, I shouldn't have said that first. I should have said this and I should have, you know, Open this verse and that and this and that. And here we are in the second service. We delivered the same message, but different and better. That's how God wired us. Let me give you very simple principles. Anything that left unattended will tend to be deteriorated. Anything that left unattended will tend to be deteriorated. And if you want something to remain the same, at the same level, then you have to take care of it. You have to maintain it. To maintain usually doesn't require much, but you need to do it diligently. So if you do nothing at all to this building, Nothing at all, it will surely deteriorate over time. But if you want to maintain this building at the same condition as it is now, you need to work on it. You need to maintain it, keep it, doing it diligently. But if you want something to be better, if you want this building to be better than it is right now, then you must have the courage to make an investment. That's a very simple principle. Investments are risky. Investments take time. Can cost you a lot of money, a lot of energy, but you will get a better result. You will get the result that you want. That's why dating looks very promising. Because there are a lot of investment going on while dating. Right? A lot of investment, a lot of sacrifices. Couple tends to sacrifice to show love and affection. Buying stuff, even if they are not even having a birthday. Even when we are tired, we say, no, I don't. Where do you want to go? That's an investment. Unfortunately, many couples stopped doing that when they were getting married. That's why their marriage is not as great as they were while they were dating. And many are wondering why. Am I marrying the wrong person? No, because you stop in fast in your own marriage. 
That's why you should never stop dating your spouse. Even in marriage relationship, to make it better. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, And we all who with unfailed faces contemplates the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which come from the Lord who is the Spirit. This means that if you walk with God and the Holy Spirit is in you, you cannot stand still. With God, you're always active, always moving forward from one glory to another glory, from one faith to greater faith. That's why with God, life is never boring. I repeat, with God, life is never boring. With God, life is never boring. With God, life is never boring. But if you don't understand this, if leaders don't understand this, if, if we as Christians don't understand this, and we do, do not know the, the creative power that works within us, then church can be so boring. But tonight, I want you to understand the creative power that you have when you, when you reconnect it with God, when you're born again, and especially when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You are a creative person. Now let's turn our attention to John chapter 10, verse 10. John 10, 10. It's very familiar verse. It says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I've come that they may have life and that they, and that they may have it more abundantly. I love about Jesus. He is very precise. He knows what he's talking about. He called the devil a thief. Very specific. This is interesting. Why a thief? Why not a robber? Why a thief? By specifically calling the devil a thief, Jesus is telling us, the very nature of our enemy. And also he was telling us the pattern in which our enemy operates. A thief takes something from the victim secretly. A thief doesn't use force at all. In robbery, you are forced to give what was yours under threat. But thief take something valuable from you secretly. A thief seeks after something that is valuable. A thief picks a target and makes a plan. A few years ago, I took a cab to work. Back in those days when I was working in a bank. Right after I got out from the taxi, just right after I got out from the taxi, someone grabbed my ankle. I was shocked. I just came out from the cab. Someone grabbed my ankle. And he said, you step on my cigarette. I said, let loose. No, no, no. You step on my cigarette. Move your feet, he said. I said, and then I saw a cigarette not far from me. And I said, that's your cigarette. There. Can you see it? No, get that loose. Otherwise. <laughs> and then, and then he, he loosed my ankle. He, he grabbed the cigarette. And he ran away. I said, very strange. Very strange person. And then what happened? After I walked a few meters away from that incident, I felt something was very strange. Uh, and then I did this. Sure enough. 
my wallet was gone. So what happened? While I'm concentrating on my ankle, someone else grabbed my wallet from behind. And they were partners taking my wallet. They ran away. A thief takes advantage of someone who is not paying attention into their belongings. It takes few seconds, few minutes, or maybe few days before a victim realizes it, realizes that what they have is actually gone. They might think they still have it, but actually they don't have it anymore. And that's how our enemies work. I have seen many people lose what they have, but they don't realize it. They think they still have it. The devil had stolen their faith, their passion, their joy, and they didn't even know it. Let me tell you a story. It's a true story. I know someone back home was very, very passionate about building the church. He was an elder in that church, in a church, a businessman, very successful one. He was always serving at church, hardly missing any Sunday because he was very passionate. He was very committed. He would not have any business meeting on Sunday. It's a holy day, he said. Sure enough, his business grew rapidly. And just like everybody else, as he climbed up higher, he became more successful. And as you climb up, climb up higher, you begin to see things that you have never seen before. Right? If you climb up higher, you will see things that you have never seen before. He saw more opportunities coming toward him. And sure enough, he started doing things that he thought will benefit his business. But actually, those were things that he was never called to do. And he became busier and busier. He started to skip Sunday services because of his business. He needs to be in a meeting somewhere. Or he needed to go overseas. Nothing wrong with that. But obviously, church was no longer a priority in his heart. The enemy tricked him. He started to lose his original vision. I want you to write this down. One of the ways the enemy steals your vision is by giving you another vision. One of the ways that the enemy steals your vision is by giving you another vision. Let me tell you this. Just because you see an open door, it doesn't mean it is an opportunity for you to enter in. Just because you see an open door, it doesn't mean it is an opportunity that you should enter. You have to make sure that it is the right door for you. That's why you need to always remember why you do what you do and whom you do it for. Because if, as you climb up higher and you do want to be successful, but as you climb up higher, you will see things that you have never seen before. You see opportunities that you have never seen before. But if you still hang on your, to your vision, to your purpose, you will not easily get distracted. But if you forget why you do what you do, why you are climbing up, then you are easily distracted because you see something else. Do you, do you, know what, do you understand what I'm tr trying to say to you? If you're not careful, then you, you will easily trap into doing something you are not called to do, and that's the beginning of your downfall. So in this case, the enemy has stolen his vision. Then his faith, his passion, his commitment, 
and he's totally unaware of it. Now Jesus says, this is the pattern, the enemy, how the enemy works. It is to, he comes to, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's the pattern. And if you don't realize that something has been stolen from you, something is stolen from you, then the devil will try to move to the next level, which is to kill. And for a very long time, I don't understand this. For a very long time, I don't understand this statement. Because this is, this was my questions. I said, how can you destroy someone after you already killed him? Right? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. What's the point of destroying someone if you already killed him? <laughs> ah, for so long, for so long, I don't understand this. It doesn't make sense to me until I discovered that the original word for kill in the Greek was tuo, T-H-U-O, tuo, which also means to sacrifice. Because like, like many, like many, you probably think that kill is an end of life. But the, in the original Greek language, it's also meant to sacrifice. Now, this is what it means. The devil, the devil loves to create conditions or situations where you cannot see any other way to solve your problem other than to sacrifice or to surrender what once is valuable to you. Let me repeat. The devil loves to create conditions or situations where you cannot see any other way to solve your problems other than to sacrifice or to surrender what once is valuable to you. And in this case, he became busier and busier and started to lose his desire to serve. He felt tired of doing ministry and began to complain about many things, including the way the pastor made decisions. So much so that one day, because of the, uh, the amount of traveling that he had to do, he saw no other way than to give up his position as an elder and step away from the, minist the ministry. Even though he still promised that he would come to church whenever he can. But since he wasn't involved in the ministry anymore, he became more involved in his business with his business partner who were non-believers. And he began to visit nightclubs, partying hard, get involved with another woman. Slowly but sure, his marriage began falling apart. He even stopped coming to church. And unfortunately, his business didn't do so well either. Now his wife left him. His children hate him. And his life is pretty much destroyed. Can you see the pattern that the devil works? How the enemy works in his life? This businessman lost what once was so valuable to him. The devil stole it from him. And that's why it is so important for us to guard what we have. The Bible says, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The treasure in our heart, that is what the devil is after. The treasure in our heart, which is your faith, your passion, your love. That's, that's why the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issue of life. Proverbs 4, 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issue of life. And now, this is the question. What is the best way to guard what we have in our heart? To guard usually gives an idea of being passive. Or defensive. Just like the guard in front of the Buckingham Palace just stand there 
passively. But let me tell you this, friends. The best way to guard is to work it. The best way to guard is to tame it. The best way to, to guard is to, multi, to cultivate it. The best way to keep what you have is to work it. The best way to keep your faith is to work it. When you work on your faith, you will not have, you will, not only will the devil have no chance of stealing it, but you have a, a great chance to make your faith stronger. In order to keep your marriage, you need to work it. For you to keep your health, you need to work out. Right? In order for you to keep your job, is to work it, to be the best at it. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out yourself, your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasures. Work out your salvation, the Bible says. When you work it out, you tap into the potential inside of you. You unleash your potential. You invest. You need to invest in yourself. Then you will have a better life. Then you will have a better marriage. You become a better minister. You become a better businessman and God will take you from glory to greater glory because his spirit is working inside of you let me close with this I like sport at least I like watching sport <laughs> this <laughs> in sport they say that offense is the best defense you will not get much attack if you keep the enemy in their own area. Friends, life is never boring with God because you go from strength to strength, from faith to faith, from glory to greater glory. That's why when I revisit Genesis, I was stunned. I stopped for a moment when God said to Adam, when he put Adam in the garden and he said, I want you to tend it and I want you to keep it. God gave us the first principle in the garden the best way to keep what you have is to work it the best way to keep what you have is to work it whatever you have in your hand at this moment do not complain invest in it work it do the best and you will move from glory to a get to greater glory in Jesus name amen, amen.